Well, that was a blessing. Amen. And uh, I have been t- thoroughly, me and my wife have been blessed this week uh, by the meeting. Um, uh, just everything. Uh, preaching's been wonderful. Um, the lessons have been good. And uh, we have uh, just been rejuvenated uh, in our spirits this week. And, you know, a lot of times a prayer when you go to a place like this, and you know, you're, you're preaching and, and doing some sessions is you want to be a blessing. And certainly that's the truth. But uh, it's always wonderful when you go and boy, you're just blessed tremendously yourself, you know. And uh, sometimes you don't realize how much you need preaching as a preacher, you know, because we, we give it out all the time and Sunday morning night, Sunday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And, uh, and then when you hear some things and the Lord speaks to your heart, it's just, it's just wonderful. And so I've enjoyed it. Uh, it's just been right on and I've been helped this week. So praise the Lord for that. Uh, also being my uh, last time to publicly say this, I did want to say thank you to everybody, uh, Fairhaven Baptist Church and uh, all that you've done and your, the, just the blessing of the week and your hospitality and your kindness and all the nice things that you said. We've met some very nice people. We've uh, renewed some friendships with some folks, got to know some people better. And it's just been wonderful. And you've got, you've all been just, just wonderful to us. And you said so many nice things to us and to my wife. Amen. Well, just about everybody said everything nice. But uh, it's been great. And the uh, truth is, we've heard the last couple uh, messages about the importance of your wife. And uh, I think every preacher would uh, admit that, that uh, how important our wives are. You know, everybody's story is a little bit different, but for us, of course, we were first-generation Christians, so we had to face those battles that first-generation Christians face. Everybody has their own battles. I understand that. I'm not saying ours were, in, were worse or anything like that. But, you know, being looked down upon as being strange, as if we joined a cult, some decisions we had to made, make with our children and grandparents and allowing them to stay places and things like that. And, and then the God calling me into the ministry and leaving a career and going to Bible college with three kids and a wife and and uh, my wife has been uh, by my side the whole way and has been just a wonderful blessing and has always said, if it's the Lord's will, just I'll, I'll follow you, you know. And, and she's been a great, great uh, follower and a blessing. And, and uh, by the way, as a preacher's wife, you do need, I'm sure every preacher would say this, you do need a little bit of thick skin like we heard about, you know. And uh, that's just something that goes with the territory because, you know, it, things happen and you go through difficulties and so forth. So I appreciate very, very much my wife. Amen. Did I get that right, honey? Did I leave anything out? (laughs) Good. Amen. And uh, (laughs) it's good to see Sarah, too. Sarah Edwards, of course, uh, just uh, out of our church. And um, Sarah was one of those students that uh, was the example. You know, you have those as seniors and juniors that you want your students to follow her, you know, and she was a great uh, example to our ladies, and we were so glad when she, we heard her coming out here uh, to school, and uh, so she was a blessing. Her parents, longtime members of Capital Baptist Church before I got there, and uh, they were a blessing, just very involved. Her dad teaches Sunday school and sings and leads music and does all kinds of things, and so it is just great to, to see her here, and we thank the Lord for that. All right, well, let's go ahead and uh, take our Bibles. I'd like to return to the book of Jonah, chapter 3. I I uh, started there two days ago, Tuesday morning, and preached a message on the uh, key ingredient to revival being the Word of God. And so we'll begin reading here in a moment here in verse 3. Notice the Bible says, So Jonah rose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey, and Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. 
Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way, from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Notice verse 10. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Look at chapter 4 and verse 11, as God says these final words to Jonah. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? We'll stop there and let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It's a joy to be here this morning. And Lord, you know my heart, I want to be a blessing. Please use me for your glory. I need and ask for a fresh filling of thy spirit. May thy word go forth today with power and clarity. Please, I pray for liberty in the pulpit this morning. And Lord, for those that are listening, give us all ears to hear that we might understand the truths that, Lord, I'm going to preach on this morning. Lord, I recognize I need your enablement today. For you told us that without you, we can do nothing. And we believe that. I can't preach without you. We can't listen without you. We can't respond without you. So we need thee this morning. Please guide and direct throughout the message. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you remember when the third chapter of the book of Jonah closed... Nineveh, a city that had its roots way back in Genesis chapter 10, you can actually find it mentioned there for the first time. And in Jonah's day, as I mentioned a couple days ago, had risen to become the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. They had just experienced, as this chapter closed, a great moving of God. It was an amazing thing. We would, I believe, call it revival. When God's prophet Jonah finally finally entered into the city of Nineveh. The year was about 824 B.C., and the Assyrian king was a man by the name of Shalmaneser III. He was on his deathbed, and here Jonah, after the reluctance, now his obedience to God, he enters into this city, and he preaches a God-ordained, a bold, a simple message to the people of Nineveh. It's very simple. In fact, we read the content of it there in, in verse 3, where Jonah, so Jonah rose, went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey, and Jonah began to enter into the city here in verse 4, a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And we know what happened. The people of Nineveh responded. It was a remarkable response, to say the least. We read, as I read a few moments ago, in verses 5, beginning in verse 5 on, that the entire city of Nineveh believed God. They repented of their sin. Imagine the entire city. We're talking in this day about 2 million people. Uh, even the king of Nineveh issues this edict for the entire city to fast and pray and that everyone turn from their evil ways. And we read that the people of Nineveh gladly submitted. And God responded in verse 10 by uh, saying uh, there, God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So we see God spared this city from judgment. He turned from his intent to destroy them, and the entire city of Nineveh experienced the grace and mercy and forgiveness of God. I don't know what it was like, but my imagine would say uh, uh, a lot of things uh, changed in Nineveh. I mean, to put it in today's uh, uh, terms, we could say that liquor stores closed, the bars closed down, uh, gambling joints closed down, crime was gone, people got right with God, people got right with one another. What an amazing thing it must have been. Someone must have thought, what is this going on in Nineveh? But I want you to turn with me a few pages to the right to the book of Nahum. 
Jonah, Micah, and Nahum, chapter 1. And I'd like to read a few verses from Nahum, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Notice we read the burden of Nineveh. The book of the vision of Nahum, the Alkashite, God is jealous and the Lord revenges. Uh, the Lord revenges and is furious. Uh, the Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. As Jonah closes Jonah chapter 3, we find a city that is right with God, living for God. Everything changed. Uh, now we come to the book of Nahum and we read something quite different. While God was talking about his grace and his mercy given to Nineveh in Jonah chapter 3 and 4, now here in the book of Nahum, we find he's furious at them. That's a big word. God is furious at Nineveh. And I want to ask myself, what happened? Why? Why? Why is God so mad? This morning I'm going to preach on this subject. What happened to Nineveh? The book of Nahum is one of our 12 minor prophet books. Not much is known about this man, Nahum. His name means consolation. He was from a place, as we read in verse 1 of Nahum, he was an Elkashite, meaning he was a, from a place called Elkosh. Some Bible scholars believe that this town was located in the northern section of Israel by the Sea of Galilee, that some believe that it was a town that was later named Capernaum. Because Capernaum literally means the village of Nahum. Nothing else is known about this man, uh, his personal history. He, he's mentioned nowhere else in the Bible. He's listed in this particular one in, in no other genealogies. But there are two vitally important facts uh, that we need to know about the book of Nahum. One is this. This book's about one thing and one thing alone. The coming destruction of the great city of Nineveh. When you and I think of Nahum, we ought to think of Nineveh. And then the second thing is this. This book was written about 120 to 150 years after the book of Jonah. And here in this small amount of time, comparatively speaking, we find that Nahum is foretelling of the fall of this great city that was going to, and by the way, did take place in 612 B.C. He is proclaiming very specifically and giving very detailed information about the doom of this great city, Nineveh. And I want to ask why. Don't you? I do. What happened to Nineveh? How, how did they go from a city that was blessed of God uh, to a city that was cursed of God and would even be destroyed by God? You know, the story of Nineveh is a lesson for all of us. It's a lesson for every nation. It's a lesson for every church. It's a lesson for every preacher, and it's a lesson for every individual believer. It's a lesson that deals with this, the responsibility that comes with knowing truth. Let's consider, first of all, number one, the privilege of Nineveh, the privilege of Nineveh. You know that during the days of Jonah, Nineveh was a tremendously privileged place. And they were privileged for one primary reason, perhaps not why we think, but not because of their size, although that was a blessing from God. Not because of their wealth, not, not because of their power. Uh, they were a privileged people in the days of, of, of Jonah because God chose to do something. God chose to send to the people of Nineveh truth, light. God sent them, one of his prophets, to proclaim to them 
the truth. You know, there's two things we need to understand about truth. First of all, God's deliverance of truth. You know, what we often forget is that, uh, that the deliverance of truth uh, is a great privilege. It is an absolute privilege. Hearing the Word of God preached, hearing the Word of God taught, that is a privilege. When God sends a missionary to a place to, to deliver God's Word, understand that is a privilege. When He places you in a place like this, a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church, uh, in a Bible-teaching, Bible-preaching college, you are a privileged person, my friend. He puts you in a Sunday school class where week after week you are hearing the truth. If he, when he sent that soul winner to you, when you got saved, whenever he sends it to a life of a lost person, understand that person's a privileged person. You're in a Christian school where day after day you, you hear the truth. Uh, week after week you hear the truth. Year after year you hear it. Uh, the principles of God's word. You are a privileged person. Think of all the verses you've heard. Uh, think of all the things you've memorized. Think of all the sermons you've heard. Think of all the junior church lessons you've, you've heard or taught. Uh, many of you have grown up in, in a Christian home. You have received a great privilege from God. You have been given great light. And it's a privilege. Hold your hand here in Nahum and go over, if you would, to Acts chapter 17. I want to I show you something here. Acts chapter 17. Apostle Paul in his second missionary journey. Notice verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. You know, there's something that catches my attention there in verse 1 of Acts chapter 17, and I wonder if the people of Thessalonica realize this. Notice in verse 1, we read that Paul and Silas, as they were going to Thessalonica, they passed through two different places. Amphipolis and Apollonia. Without stopping to preach to them. Why? Why, why, did he, why did he just pass through? Why don't we read he stopped at Amphipolis and he preached the word of God there in Apollonia? Uh, no, we don't read that at all. He passed this city, went through it, went through this city. He was making a beeline to Thessalonica because God sent him there. Why didn't he stop? I, I don't know really the answer to that other than this. I, I wonder if the peace people of Thessalonica understood how privileged they were that God, uh, don't be afraid of this word, I'm not a Calvinist, God chose them to hear the word of God. Amen. He chose that city Amen. that they received light that other places did not receive. My point is this, it's a privilege when God delivers truth to us. Amen. You know, I think in my own life of men that have invested their life in me. I, I think of that night, that Tuesday night that my wife and I went to that visitation and we sat there and I think of Pastor Bird, how he delivered to me the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then I think after that of the Pauls in my life of people that taught me and trained me and discipled me and brought me along. Understand something, that was a great privilege and you have the same type of people in your life as well. Amen. And you ought to thank God for them. But go beyond them to the God who sent them. Amen. Because it's a privilege when God delivers truth. So we see God's deliverance of truth, but also notice God's expectation of truth. Do you know when the, with the privilege of receiving God's truth comes responsibility? May, may I say great responsibility? 
God did not go through all that he went through to get Jonah uh, to go to Nineveh for no reason. He had certain expectations. It's the same with me and you. He didn't go through all he went through in our lives to get the truth to us, to send a soul winner by, to put us in a Bible-believing church, or, or by putting us in a Christian school, or a Christian college, or a Christian home. He did not give us all that truth to waste it. It's not given to us to squander away or just fill our heads with Bible knowledge. God expects more. He expects a return on his, his investment. Do you know the more truth we are exposed to, the more responsibility we have. There's an expectation there. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 4. The Lord Jesus Christ tried to really made reference to this principle here in Matthew chapter 4. And Matthew chapter 11, we'll be going there in a moment. Notice verse 13, And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum. By the way, those that have been to the promised land, to the the land of Israel have been there. You know what that looks like. It looks like rubble today. And this is why. He came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zebulun and Ephthalim, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, notice, the land of Zebulun and the land of Nephthalim, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness, mark it down, saw great light. He could have chosen to go anywhere. But he chose to go to these towns and they saw the Lord Jesus Christ. They heard him preach. They saw his miracles. They were given great light by God. But there's a responsibility with that. Turn over to Matthew chapter 11 because we'll see that they squandered that light. They wasted it, I should say. Notice Matthew 11, verse 20, Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done. Because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. If they saw what you saw, it would have been different. You were privileged. Verse 22, but I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Those are some pretty bold words right there. When we think of Sodom, we think of sodomy, and we think of the evilness and the wickedness of that sin. But notice what Christ says. There's something even worse to that in his mind. When someone has been given great light, and they squander it, and they waste it, and they throw it away, and they do not use it for God's glory, he says that's worse. There'll be greater judgment in the day of judgment for them. Thank God when Nineveh was given great light through Jonah, they responded. They did it first when they heard the word of God, when they heard the voice of the preacher. They got right. They repented. They, they received that light that was given. By the way, the church at Thessalonica did the same thing. That's why, or the, should I say the people, that's why they became a church. They received his, their words as they were in truth, the words of God, not as the words of men. And it became a great light. In that area of the world. So I wonder this morning, what are you doing with the truth that you've received? What, what are you going to do? What am I doing with the light I've received? Uh, you see, being exposed to great light is a privilege. So we see, first of all, the privilege of Nineveh. I want us to consider, secondly, the problem with Nineveh. So what happened? Started out well. 
Uh, they heard Jonah, they got right, uh, they turned to God, their lives were changed, uh, uh, they began to live for God. May I say, it kind of reminds me of the first generation Christians. They turn to God. They hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and God does a remarkable change in their life. And that first generation Christian often, they don't want what the world offers because they know what the world offers. They know the vanity of this world. They've lived it and have the scars to prove it. And often that first generation lives by convictions When we get the book of Nahum, we find out that the Ninevites are back to their old ways. Go back to Nahum chapter 3. I want to show you something. Nahum chapter 3. What's happening here now in this place that had turned to God? Uh, Nineveh, I'm sorry, Nahum chapter 3 describes what's going on. Notice verse 1. Woe to the bloody city! It is all full of lies and robbery, and the prey departeth not. Describes them as a bunch of liars now. They're, they're filled with robbery. Verse 4, because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcraft said, selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcraft. Something's changed dramatically here. They're committing multitudes of whoredoms. They're back to practicing witchcraft. Uh, uh, they're practicing har uh, harlotry. And it all happened within about three generations. Depending on how you calculate a generation, some calculated 40 years, some 60. But within three, let's say three for argument's sake, uh, from three generations, that first generation in Jonah's day to the second, uh, here to the third, they, they went from a nation and a people that feared God uh, to a generation that not only did not know God, but hated him. And hated God's truth uh, and even hated God's people. How does this happen? Is there something we can learn? Most of us, particularly in this area, are familiar with the story of the life of evangelist Billy Sunday. Sunday, of course, a professional baseball player, you know the story, got saved in 1886, began to preach from 1895 to 1935. It's said that Billy Sunday saw tens of thousands of converts, tens of thousands at his meetings. He preached the gospel and he preached boldly against liquor. I mean, lives changed when he preached. Cities changed when he preached. Billy Sunday was married to a woman named Nell. They had four children. One girl died of pneumonia, three boys. A boy named George, born in 1892. Another named William, Jr., born in 1901. And Paul, born in 1907. I was reading the portion of a biography, and I want you to listen to what it said about his children. It said, those three sons were the source of untold grief for their parents. They were drunkards. They lived wild, riotous lives and embarrassed their parents. They had a total of nine marriages between them. And all three of them died before the age of 40 in tragic, violent deaths. The oldest committed suicide after being arrested for drunkenness and auto theft. Another died while driving home drunk from a party. The other crashed an airplane and died. They had no interest in living for God. How does that happen? How does someone like a, an Alice Cooper... Uh, from the 70s, a rock and roller, have a father that's a pastor. How does that happen? Aretha Franklin, the, the queen of soul, her father was a pastor at New Bethel Baptist Church in Detroit, Michigan. How does that happen? Huey Newton, the, flat, the founder of the Black Panther Party, was the son of a Baptist preacher. How does that happen? 
How, how do we lose this next generation? How does it happen? By the way, Capital Baptist Church is similar to any ministry that's trying to live for the Lord. We have our Capital Baptist haters too. We have our bloggers. Tell how much they hate us how we're legalists, and how we do things that we do not do. And it's interesting, one of the ones that beats the drum the, the largest, I'm not going to say his name because I don't want to give him the attention. But if I said his website, many of you would know it. He attended our church. His brothers attended our church. Fathers were, uh, parents were missionaries. I won't say where because I don't want to make the link. But my point is this. How does that happen? I think every parent in this room would say, that I don't want that to happen. I have no greater joy than my children walk in truth. That's what I want. And particularly me as a first-generation Christian, I want to see this thing go and go and go and go till Jesus comes. But what will cause it to not happen? Well, two ways. First one is this. When truth isn't propagated. Well, when the truth is not passed on, that's one way it's going to happen. Turn with me back to Judges chapter 2, if you would, please. Judges chapter 2. I'm sure you know the verse. In verse 10 and 11, the Bible says in Judges 2, 11, And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, notice which, knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baal. And what is going on here? How did this next generation not know the works of God? I'll tell you how. Somebody didn't tell them. Somebody didn't pass it on. You see, it is the absolute responsibility of one generation to teach the truth to the next generation. We must do that. By the way, the primary place of this is a home. It's a home. Psalm chapter 78 says this, For he established in verse 5 a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. My children should know my testimony as well as I do. Amen. I should give them the Bible over and over. It's my responsibility. Notice verse 6, That the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. What happens in verse 7? That they might set their hope in God. Amen. We must be doing this. By the way, we must be doing it in our churches as well. Second to thee, true, thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. There it is, uh, passing uh, on from one generation to the next, the truth, and on and on it goes. That's how it's propagated. Hosea 4 and verse 1 says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. Why wasn't there knowledge of God in the land? Why wasn't there truth? Because God's people were not propagating it. A lot could be said about us. Think about it. As we look at the condition of our nation. Folks, truth is self-sustaining. But it's not self-propagating. 2 Corinthians 13, 8, For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. Yes, it's self-sustaining, but it doesn't propagate itself. You and I must pass the truth on to the next generation. And perhaps one possibility of what happened to the Ninevites was this. Yeah, they were saved. Yeah, they turned to the Lord, however you want to phrase it. But they did not pass that knowledge on to the next generation. But that's not the only possibility. Not only when truth is not propagated does it not pass on, but also this, when truth is not received. You can, I can propagate it all we want. I can preach here truth, but you have to receive it. 
You see, merely propagating the truth isn't enough. There also must be, it must be received in the heart of the person. Proverbs 30 speaks about a generation. Hardened heart, verse 11, there is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes. So yes, as we try to propagate the truth, understand that truth has to be received for it to be passed on. Do you know that it is possible for a young person in a Christian home that grows up in a Christian home, hears the truth all the time, goes to a good Bible-believing, fundamental, independent Baptist church, uh, goes to a college like this to hear the truth and not receive it? Do you know that's possible? You say, of course it is. We see it. Yes, we do. We see it. I'm not ignorant of this stuff. Someone could pass through these doors, go through four years, yet go out and not live for God. Why is that? They did not receive the truth into their heart that was given to them. By the way, it only takes the rejection of one truth to change your life. Who you marry. By the way, you marry someone that's wrong. That person becomes the will of God. And with that one rejection of the truth, well, I'm just going to marry who I want to. I'm not going to listen to my parents. I'm not going to listen to the pastor. I'm not going to follow the word of God. I'm going to do what I want to do. You may do that. But you have just changed not only the direction of your life, but the direction of generations below you, their lives as well. It'd be the same thing with a job. We've had people in our church, I'm sure you have as well, that decide uh, they, they want to make more money and here's a job offer and they choose to choose a, choose a job that causes them to, to work a Sunday night. Right. And they take it. And they have this idea, well, I'll be better off. Let's see how that works out for you over time. Do you remember the difference between the, the man that was a fool in Matthew chapter 7 and the wise man? You understand, you know the story. Both of them heard the word of God. Both of them heard it. But one did it. One received it and the other didn't. You know, there's young people in every church that do that. It's sad to see. It's sad to see. They walk out of a great, great church not perfect. No church is perfect. Well, this and that. I understand. I know. But if you're hearing the truth week after week, you're in a great place. Don't reject it. Don't set it aside. Take it into your heart and live it. You see, God gave Nineveh, Nineveh the truth so that they would do with it what he wanted them to do with it. Propagate it and receive it. But they didn't do it. Which leads me to number three. Not only the privilege of Nineveh, not only the problem with Nineveh, notice thirdly the, pro the proclamation against Nineveh. So here they are. Generations pass for some reason. Either the truth was not propagated or the truth was not received from one generation to the next. And we find that God is absolutely enraged with them. We read in verse 2 of Nahum chapter 1, God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. He's talking about Nineveh. That word burden in verse 1 has the idea of impending doom. And he reserveth his wrath for his enemies. My point is this. It is a dangerous thing when someone has been the, uh, given the privilege to be exposed to the truth of God's word, uh, to know God's truth, yet chooses to reject it. That's a dangerous thing, my friend, for all of us. There is much more accountability for someone who knows the truth than someone who does not. Because you've been given a great privilege. To whom much is given, much is required. Go over to 2 Peter chapter 2. I want to show you something. 2 Peter chapter 2. Look at verse 20.
We read 2 Peter 2.20, For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. Look at this phrase here. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. It's going to be worse. God is much harder, if you don't mind the term, on someone who knows the truth and rejects it than someone who never knew the truth at all. Folks, it's no accident, students, that you're here. Well, I just came here to, you know, just do a year of Bible. See what... It's no accident. It's no accident you're in a church like this. It's no accident you're hearing the things that you're hearing. God has orchestrated your life. And he's brought you here and he's giving you things that he wants you to listen to, but not just listen to, receive them into your heart. And he has great expectations from you because of what you know. You know, in a little while, according to the book of Nahum, Nineveh would fall to the Medes, Babylonians, and, and the Scythians in 612 B.C. If you were to go there today, you'd find nothing. It's gone. Same with Capernaum. I mentioned that a little earlier. I remember standing there and looking at, at the rubble that was there, the remains of a city. We walked over. He showed us where the old synagogue was and showed us the layers of the synagogue and say, right down there at the bottom is about the time when Jesus Christ was there. And you look at that place and you want to say, what happened to it? It's gone. It's gone. It's rubble now. What happened to it? The story tells itself. They had been given great light. They saw things that others didn't see. They heard things that others didn't hear. And when they heard it, they said, no thanks. God said, you're done. I want to challenge us all this morning. What are we doing with the truth that we've been given. We have been given a great privilege. I, I, I was telling Pastor Damon yesterday, when after I got saved, I wasn't even saved a year, and uh, I, I had the opportunity to go to Dr. D.A. Waite's uh, Bible seminar in his home for eight hours a day for an entire week, uh, just about, about six or seven of us in the room listening to him teach and preach on the inspiration, preservation, canonicity, textual criticism of the King James Bible. And I look back on that and I think, what a privilege that was. And I think of the people that God has sent into my life that have helped me along the way. But I have to remember, that's a privilege. God could have put, picked other people. And by the way, he could have picked other people to put in this school, in this church. But he picked you. And he picked me. And he expects a return from his investment. Question is, will we give it to him? Let's pray together.